Welcome back, everyone, to Furthering Christendom. I am your co-host, Mike DeVito, here, as always, with Dr. Tyler McNabb. And before we get going, I just want to thank you. Uh, we're, we're heading into season two now. I want to thank everybody for a great first season. Uh, Tyler and I could not have imagined how well this would have went. So to all our guests, all the listeners, everybody who participated in the first season, thank you so much. We're really excited for season two. And to kick it off, we have one of the heaviest hitters in philosophy out there, so it's a perfect way to get going, we have Dr. Michael Ray. Dr. Ray is the Reverend John A. O'Brien Professor of Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, uh, as well as a director of the Center of Philosophy of Religion. And Dr. Ray has written extensively in so many areas, metaphysics, philosophy, religion, analytic theology, um, just across the board. Like I said, one of the uh, leading philosophers uh, out there. And so Dr. Ray, it really is an honor to have him on the podcast today. How are you doing? How's everything going? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on the on the show. Before we even get going, Dr. Ray, you, you're in charge of one of the you know most prestigious and biggest philosophy programs out there. What has this past semester been like with all the different you know stuff going on with COVID? And I'd have to imagine the position that you're in has not been easy trying to deal with all the logistics of everything going on here. Uh, basically, everything is ground to a halt. Um, Notre Dame made us defer all of our fellowship offers for this year. And um, so we had no visitors in our Center for Philosophy of Religion. Um, and so we basically just kind of shut down for the year. I've taught my classes and that's been about it. Jeez. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to come on because we know uh, how busy things have been. We are gonna talk about one of my favorite books in philosophy, The Hiddenness of God. Um, Obviously, this is the book that you've written, and uh, just so much to it. So, Tyler, I'm going to kick it over to you, and you start off the questions, but really excited about uh, getting into this book. Yeah, so I, I figure that uh, we could start off with kind of like a basic question, um, and that's, what's the problem of divine hiddenness? If you can go ahead and uh, kind of explain that for us. Yeah, good. Um, I, in a certain way, it's not totally basic. <laughs> um, there's... Uh, I guess I would say there are, there's multiple problems of divine hiddenness. Um, uh, what I'll give you is first just the kind of, like, I think the problem that every believer or just about every believer struggles with at some point or other, you might call that a kind of common sense problem of hiddenness. And then I'll give you the problem that um, has dominated the literature in philosophy of religion. And they're, they're related, obviously. The kind of common sense problem is just, um, you know, look, we're told, uh, or Christianity tells us that God's our heavenly father um, and loves us like a perfect parent. Um, but a whole lot of us don't feel like we are treated by God in the ways that even a decent parent would treat us. I mean, like, you know, my kids, I tell them every day that I love them. You know, when they fall down and get hurt, uh, I go over to them and I comfort them tangibly, right? Like I don't just, uh, you know, stay in another room and leave it to them to infer from the things I've provided for them that, you know, I care about their pain and things like that. I go talk to them. Um, and a lot of people just, they don't have experiences that they take to be communication from God or anything like that. Um, I mean, I think one of the formative instances that sort of set me down this path was talking to a friend of mine in college and she just started crying and said, you know, like I've, I've served God my entire life. Why can't he just whisper, I love you, you know? Uh, yeah, why not? Um, that's a sort of common sense problem. Um, the problem that has dominated the literature um, is more one about belief and it's due to John Schellenberg. He's formulated it a little differently over the years, but the, the kind of simple idea is, um, you know, um, if you love someone, at minimum, you're gonna be open to relationship with them. And if you're open to relationship with them, at minimum, you're gonna do whatever you can on your end to remove obstacles to the relationship. Right. So that means like, um, 
you won't hide from them, <laughs> for example. Um, if they have no clue that you exist and you can let them know that you exist, you'll do that. Um, uh, if they have no clue that you're interested in relationship and you can let them know, uh, you'll do that and so on and so forth. Um, like you'll, you'll take away the things that block relationship. Um, they might still be resistant, but you know, okay, you're not expected necessarily to overcome that. And what he says is that there are a lot of people who don't have relationships with God and for reasons that seem like um, those reasons are easily removed on God's end without interfering with them at all. So, you know, he, like one of the things that he's most recently made a lot of is the fact that people, prehistoric people, um, it seems just entirely lacked the concept of the God of Christianity, right? Um, uh, so like how could they even begin to believe in God if they don't even have the concept, right? Um, and he thinks, you know, minimally, if God's open to relationship with them, he'll at least give them the concept. And, you know, people who are seeking God, he would at least give them evidence you know, and things like that. Um, I mean, so the, I mean, maybe the way to think about it is like this. Divine hiddenness is sort of the phenomenon where, um, you know, seems like a lot of people don't have what they would need to have to form reasonable belief in God. It seems like a lot of people aren't getting what they at least very much want. And a lot of us might even say that they need in terms of expressions of love from God or experience of God or whatever. Um, and both of, like both of these aspects of divine hiddenness, they're just not at all what you'd expect if God loves us like a perfect heavenly parent. Uh, very well put. Uh, on this note, can you go ahead and sort of uh, summarize, take as long as you want or take as little as you want, uh, your response to the problem of divine hiddenness yeah, and, and found I, in your volume? Yeah. Um, so I think of it as a kind of two-pronged response. Um, the first prong is what I think the, like the Christian tradition generally um, has to say uh, in response to the problem. Um, the second prong is sort of like, well, the first prong relies on a particular aspect of the Christian tradition that a lot of us aren't fans of nowadays. And if you don't like that, then here, the second prong is for you. So that's sort of how I think of it. So first prong is um, like this. Uh, the divine hiddenness problem is driven by a lot of assumptions about what perfect love would look like, right? Uh, I mean, just think about the things that I've said a few minutes ago, you know, perfect, loving parents do this for their kids, loving parents do that for their kids, people who, you know, if you love somebody, you will blah, 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 like that. Um, what we're doing, obviously, is operating with a human concept of love, and we're thinking that, you know, well, so God would be that, but better. Um, but one kind of dominant idea in the Christian tradition has been that God's attributes are um, they're, they're so far beyond the human correlates of those attributes um, that we can't really claim to have anything but a sort of analogical understanding of them. Um, and I, sort of the analogy I like to use to explain this is um, like imagine an interspecies uh, parental re relationship, right? So suppose, um, you know, a lion cub is being parented by a bear, right? Um, that bear's gonna, or, you know, take an example from fiction, right? Uh, a human child is being raised by apes, right? This is the story of Tarzan. Um, uh, like the parent is going to do a lot of things that seem um, at best weird and maybe unloving, you know, from the point of view of that, um, the, the other species child. Um, 
and it's it's not that the like it's not that the parent is failing in love or does, you know it's not a like not satisfying appropriate standards of parenthood or something like that it's just they're so radically different the love the love just looks like not what you'd expect right and it's not a perfect analogy by any stretch but um but still the basic idea is that divine love is uh it's totally beyond human love and the sort of the punchline that comes from that thought is um you can't infer from violated expectations that God's not loving, right? I mean, the tradition, of course, is committed to the, the thought that, you know, whatever divine love is exactly, once you understood it, you'd say, oh, I could see why we call that love. And furthermore, it's way the heck better than human love, mm. right? So, I, I mean, you got to add that. Otherwise, it just looks like divine love is a name for just some weird other attribute, right? That may not be love at all. Um, but the, the tradition is committed to this idea that no, it's divine love is, um, it's not what human love is, it's better. And in ways that we can only grasp by way of analogy. Um, well, so, and again, if that's true, then then inferences from violated expectations are blocked. Um, uh, you get what I call in the book this humility about expectations principle, right? So you, you know, when, so I would expect, given my concept of love, to sort of hear more verbally from God. I don't get that. Um, but humility about expectations leads me to think, yeah, okay, but I can't. I can't just reason from that to the conclusion that God doesn't love me. I have to I have to acknowledge that there's um, something even deeper than interspecies difference or intercultural difference, you know, or something like that. Um, and you visit another culture and they do things unexpected. You don't just infer that they're like, they don't care about you or that they want you to have a bad visit or, you know, they're trying to torture you. Um, it, where, you know, where there's goodwill all around, you just assume, yeah, okay, maybe I just don't totally get what's going on. Standards are different. And this is that idea of ratcheted way up. Um, still, uh, people throughout the tradition have varied in, so this, this idea I've been referring to is people talk about it under the heading divine transcendence, right? And people have varied in how just how transcendent they think God is really strong versions say we can't apply concepts at all to God I don't even know how to make sense of that um, uh, you say God's transcendent that seems like a concept that you're applying to God right um, but um, but some folks want to say look this this idea is just totally on the wrong track I mean um, when we say that God loves us we mean God, in the perfectly ordinary sense of the term, loves us. Um, the transcendence idea we should just reject. We we don't like we don't predicate love only analogically of God. We mean it literally. God literally loves us. So this gets to the second prong. To that person, I say, well, still your inferences are blocked, and the reason is um, basically. Um, the, like it seems that the way a lot of people think about divine love, especially in the context of divine hiddenness, is they think it's just human love maxed out, right? Um, I mean, that's how we think about divine power. It's the human concept of power maxed out. Divine knowledge is sort of what we normally think of as knowledge maxed out, taken to the limit. So love would be the same thing. So like, I love my kid. That means my kid is a high priority for me. Um, but I don't love my kid in an ideal way. So, I, you know, I'm a selfish human being like everybody else. And I have other um, interests and desires, uh, some totally legit, some not totally legit. But, you know, the fact is like, I'm not 100% totally oriented around my kid. Um, sometimes the kid wants to play and it would even be good for them to play. And, 
I'm just tired. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, just to. I'm with you. I want to watch a show with my wife, you know, or something like that. Um, and um, or I don't like that game. Um, so, you know, and, and again, it's not that I don't love my kid, but like the fact is, it's not like I am just putting all of my energy into promoting their well-being, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or achieving union with them, right? So like those are the key components of love according to most accounts of love. Um, desire for union, desire for the person's good. And people think if God was perfectly loving, well, then God would have maximal desire for our good and maximal desire uh, for our for union with us, or well, one or the other at least, and maybe both. And this would be an absolute top priority for God. And since God is omnipotent, unlimited in resources, God doesn't face the same kinds of limitations that force me to prioritize the goods I pursue, right? I mean, I have five kids, actually. I, so I'm not, like, I can't pursue all of their good 100%, even if I was inclined to, because I got to, like, I got to do things with all of them, you know. Um, but that's because I'm limited. Well, so I say in the book, um, divine love actually wouldn't be like that. Um, and sort of for I don't know how many reasons. I just sort of a cluster of reasons <laughs> that I'll give you right now. I, I mean, first of all, um, in the human case, I, so I'm really persuaded by an article by Susan Wolf called Moral Saints, um, where she argues that um, her, the concept of sainthood she's working with, it's not like the concept that, you know, uh, it's not the sort of common sense concept of the concept operative in the Christian tradition. It's a technical term for a person who is totally oriented around promoting the well-being of others. And she says, a life like that would be impoverished. Um, like if you were really totally oriented around promoting the well-being of others, like if you're a moral saint in that sense, you'd have no you'd devote none of your energies to things like um, sports or appreciating good art, uh, or playing guitar, you know, or anything like that. But she says, most of us have a concept of a life well lived according to which there's space for those kinds of projects. Um, and she says, in fact, if you don't have those kinds of projects, like you, you don't have your own interests and hobbies, there's a real sense in which you've kind of just lost your personhood and you've become a sort of like you're just you're like you've been overwhelmed by the needs of others. And basically what I say in the book is that that would be the case with God too. If God did not have God's own, and if God is just a cosmic utility maximizing machine, totally oriented about around promoting the well-being of human beings, God wouldn't have really a personality. God, God's personhood would be impoverished. Um, and, uh, I, I mean, I realize that in saying this, some people are going to say, well, but the Bible tells us God loves us so much. And so, like, you're saying something unbiblical. And to that, I say, not at all. I mean, the Bible says all over the place that God does things for God's glory, right? And that that's actually a top priority for God. Um, that never really sort of strikes modern ears all that well. But if you think of it, if you sort of recast that as, Look, a top priority for God is living out uh, the divine personality, right? That's basically the line that I'm pushing. Um, and I mean, certainly the Bible makes it clear that we are to worship God, not the other way around. But like, what is it to worship God? Well, in the ideal case, it is to wholly orient yourself around God's interests. If God were to be wholly oriented around my interests, um, if that were a top priority for God, I'd be worshiped by God, right? But in, I mean, the Christian tradition has never said that God should do that, right? God is not to worship human beings. Um, and I mean, the other thing I say is, 
human beings, again, I totally think God loves us, but we, we aren't even fitting objects for maximal divine love. The most fitting objects for maximal divine love are the persons of the Trinity. I think God the Father gives maximal love to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and all the way around. Um, of course, being God, God's got all manner of other love for us. And I think that, I mean, I guess, I like I think that part of what the Bible teaches is that although our short-term interests do get sacrificed here and there um, for other goods that God's pursuing, who knows what exactly, um, God has basically promised us that the evils we suffer will be defeated in the context of our lives. And basically what that means is that at the end of all things, we'll look back at the at our total life include that includes the evils that we've suffered. And we'll look at that and we'll say those evils were really bad, but that life was really good. And somehow those that it's not that the life that the goods just sort of outweighed the bad. It's like the whole thing together has been made into a, a beautiful picture, you know, sort of like the story of Joseph uh, in the Bible or the story of Jesus. Heck, I mean, um, that whole, each of those stories, you know, the story where Joseph is sold into slavery and then comes out of it and then ends up saving his family. Thanks to the position that he got as a result, the story of Jesus, you know, according to which, I mean, he lives a perfectly sinless, loving life, gets crucified in the end, but that brings about the salvation of humanity. Like both of those stories are stories of beautiful lives um, that include horrendous evils. And in neither case is it that the evils are just outweighed by the good things. It's like the evils are sort of integral to what makes the life beautiful somehow, right? And yet they're still evil. That, and that's that's an important point. I, I mean, a whole lot of theodicies end up accidentally saying things that seem to imply that actually the evils we suffer are not bad after all. And that seems like a problematic result. But so anyway, so that's the two pronged story. First, an appeal to divine transcendence. If you don't like divine transcendence, then another inference blocking move, namely you can't um, you can't take a kind of idealized concept of human love and use that to predict what God would do. Um, what God is going to do is balance priorities. And once you've acknowledged that there are other goods that God might be pursuing, there's room to say that divine hiddenness is permitted for the sake of those other, maybe not at all human oriented goods. Well, that, that was extremely helpful. Thank you. As someone who is a classical theist and, you know, broadly at least Thomistic, I like the first uh, response a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think it <laughs> And um, so let's say we, we can only come to, to understand God analogically. Do you think this um, undercuts perhaps inductive arguments as it pertains to natural theology? So think about Swinburne's project, right? <laughs> sort of. Um, go ahead and and um assigning probabilities to what god would or wouldn't likely do um do you, do you think this somehow undermines this sort of project um yeah i so i don't i wouldn't go so far as to say that like all natural theology is undermined um uh but there's um and i, I mean i guess i think like there are certainly some probabilities that we can assign, you know, what, what are the odds that God would create a world consisting of nothing but a million human beings in a giant frying pan suffering for a thousand years and then it winks out of existence. So I'm going to say low, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that, seems, that seems a fair probability assessment um, given what I know of God, even if all I know of God is analogical. Um, because if I guess the idea would be in that case, um, uh, because our language about God then wouldn't be analogical. There would be an equivocation going on <laughs> if yeah, we say God yeah. is love and yet and yet does that. Um, but I guess so. So the idea from how I under how I read it, uh, how I understood it, is that given that we know about God analogically, we're not in the position to kind of judge 
what existence itself would do <laughs> in uh, a, a particular situation. And so um, there's, at, there's at least some uh, sort of uh, agnosticism, like that, I guess so, some sort of uh, idea that the probability should be inscrutable, at, at least to certain things, right? About, about what God would or wouldn't do. If it applies to the problem of evil, then uh, it seemed like it would also need to uh, be applied to at least some cases within natural theology, maybe some arguments in natural theology. I'm specifically thinking about um, some of Swinburne's assumptions uh, about how God would likely make creatures with physical bodies or, you know, you know the, the first part of the existence of God. So, yeah, is, do you, are you kind of sympathetic with that idea? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm totally sympathetic with that. And with with Swinburne's work in particular, I mean, he's often got sort of, um, like, he's got pretty definite opinions about what a perfect being would do in all right. manner of circumstances. So his, like, his argument, um, uh, I, I'll say something critical here, but then I, I mean, I'm also going to express some appreciation for it. Like, his, his argument for the conclusion that, um, uh, it's extremely probable that Jesus rose from the dead, hmm. right? Um, he ends up saying the probability of Jesus' resurrection is something like 0.97, which when, yeah. when you hear that, you think like, wow. <laughs> um, and when you look at the argument, there are a lot of assumptions like, well, you know, um, if there were a God, I, I'm not sure I'm remembering them all exactly, but it's been a while. Right, right, right. Something like if, if there were a God, God, you know, um, Certainly, God would want to make a dramatic revelation. God would want to become incarnate. Um, the dramatic revelation would have to be um, like there'd have to be some kind of God would want to somehow confirm um, the things that are being said by God incarnate. You know, like and it's like a whole bunch of like God would do this, God right. would do that, and I'm thinking, like really, you know, I don't, I mean, <laughs> um, like how would you know, you know, right and and it's pretty clear that the answers to how you would know are supposed to be like, well, just like, think about if you were in that position, what's the mm -hmm. obviously reasonable thing to do? And that's not, um, those are not thoughts that are really highly sympathetic with a strong conception of divine transcendence, right? I, I mean, interestingly though, when you look at the, um, when you look at the way the argument actually plays out, um, it's not like Swinburne says, well, look, the odds of God becoming incarnate are 0.56, right? <laughs> what, what he says is something more like this. Um, it'd be better than not. And let's just plug in some numbers, you know, to get the equations going. And, but like always what he's committed to is just eh, better than not, right? Um, and and I'm not, like, I, I feel quite sure that someone who endorses a reasonably strong notion of transcendence can't say things like, well, God would surely with probability 0.6 do such and so. Um, but I'm not sure that they couldn't work with some of the um, very fuzzy assessments that mm -hmm. actually drive the argument. And when you think about the argument, I mean, it's, like really, the, I mean, what I find, and so this is the appreciative remark, what I find so cool about the his reasoning about Jesus' resurrection is, like what it basically comes down to is this, look, if you, um, if you are at all sympathetic to theism, and if you think, yeah, probably, a God who loves the world is going to make some kind of revelation and put some kind of stamp of approval on it. Um, given the other historical evidence we've got, you're led to a very high probability of the resurrection of Jesus. And, and it, it's not clear to me that, um, I mean, the super strong transcendence people can't even endorse that, I don't think. Right, but right, right, right. It's not clear to me that, like, I couldn't. Um, uh, I would just need to be wary about how I put mm -hmm. the probability. I see. Yeah, I, I remember reading his, um, uh, what's his book on the resurrection called? Is it, uh, uh, 
Right. Yeah, it came out in it came out at the same time as a bunch of other books on Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I always get the titles of Wright. his and Wright's confused. Um, yeah. But but I just remember reading going through it as a skeptical theist and just like uh, <laughs> feeling really uncomfortable with making some of these uh, assessments. But I, I'll ask you one more question and then let Mike take over. Um, uh, this will be a quick one. Uh, what do you think uh, with someone comes up to you and says, well, well, this hot idea of transcendence, it's a philosophical concept, right? But it's not really a biblical concept. If you, if you look at uh, the Bible, especially the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, uh, you're going to see a God that's right with his people and that's really anthrop anthropomorphic <laughs> and, and so on. You have a really interesting response to this in, in your book in reference to the development and um, later authors uh, of various sources within the Pentateuch. Uh, do, you, do you mind sharing that briefly? Yeah, I, so I can't remember all that off the top of my head, but um, I, so I guess basically there's, um, uh, there's a lot in scripture that points toward God's otherness, right? Um, uh, I mean, maybe the most well-known or most widely quoted passage, although I think there's actually maybe kind of something else going on in the passage, but it's the, you know, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, right? Um, and that's like that thought, um, but also, um, I mean, and one of the things I referenced in the book was just the sort of the material in scripture that points to God being non-spatial, God, you know, there's, there's a lot of threads in scripture that point to God, um, you know, not, like, not dwelling among human beings, being very set apart from the world in important ways. Um, the whole notion of divine holiness was, I mean, we usually think of holiness now as a moral concept, but initially it was a concept of separateness or other, you know, otherness. When Israel was supposed to be a holy people, a uh, priesthood set up, like they're supposed to be a priesthood set apart, right? Like that was more so kind of the notion. And I, I think what I said in the book too is that um, we have these different strands of thought intertwined in scripture, some of which are very homey and anthropomorphic, you know, God's, um, God's like a hen brooding over her chicks, you know, <laughs> things like that. I guess that's not anthropomorphic. That's um, you know poultry morphic or something. Right. Um, you know, uh, and then these other threads that talk about how totally different God is, right? Um, and what biblical scholars have said is um, these are just kind of two separate threads of thought in Scripture, and we got to take them both seriously. God is um, God's personal uh very personal and in ways that you know um like we're somehow supposed to think about god um in light of how we understand ourselves uh and yet god's very different very other right um and i i think moderate notions of divine transcendence with you know with the doctrine of analogy and all that they are trying to reconcile these two different threads right you get the you get the otherness bit with the claim that god's attributes are beyond ours um and the claim that our discourse about god is only analogical um but you get the the reasoning in light of human concepts precisely out of the doctrine and analogy um i mean sort of the way i like to think about it i I kind of talked about this in the book is um, like, I guess I think uh, we're supposed to think that all the talk about God being like a loving parent and stuff like that. Like, I, I think the way to understand that is um, we get closer to the truth about God. Think like, it's not like, Oh, God's a loving parent. Okay. Let's start cranking the inference machine. It's we get, we get increasingly closer to the truth the more we think about God as a loving parent in contrast to other ways of thinking about God, right? We get closer to the truth thinking about God as um, like a human person in lots of respects than we would in thinking about God 
as, um, you know, a jackal or as a lion or, uh, you know, pick any of a number of other creatures that have been associated with deity by other religions, right? Awesome. Well, that's, thank you, Dr. Ray. That's uh, um, great. That is just great stuff. I mean, th this book uh, really was a, was a game changer for me. And uh, I wanted to go back to the humility of expectation principle because, and, and you guys, both of you guys chime in, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, obviously divine hiddenness, the problem of divine hiddenness is closely related to the problem of evil. And yet with the problem of evil, there seems to be this clear sort of demarcation with you know, how you handle the problem philosophically and then how you handle the problem emotionally sort of on the ground. With, with your response, with the humility of expectation um, idea and this idea of divine transcendence, it seems like this is really philosophy breaking bread here, right? I feel like this has a lot of not just philosophical um, power, but sort of evangel, maybe, you know, within ministry or day-to-day -day sort of you know, the people, whether you're dealing with in the pews, this seems like a, you know, not that it's going to clear up every question, but it seems like it has some real power on the ground, right? As a, even as a philosophical position, where it's like you could talk to the person going through this and this could really help. Have, have you seen that? Like, have you seen just with, you know, dealing with people who might not be philosophers, but struggling with divine hiddenness, this is like a, as like a powerful response to the problem that might be different, say, as like a free will defense or something. Yeah, I so yeah, I'm glad you said all that. Um, this pastoral aspect of things is something that was really important to me in writing the book. Um, and I have had a number of people tell me that it's it's been useful to them in that way. Um, and it, I, you know, honestly, it's been useful to me in that way. Um, I like I've you know, I got onto this problem. Um, in large part because it really resonated <laughs> with me. You know, I've I've struggled with the hiddenness of God and you know things like that. Um, and uh, and thinking through some of the ideas here, I've I've found helpful. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But myself, I mean, I've used it with people who aren't philosophers. I find it such a great response. Get, getting back, I guess, to the philosophical, the more you know, philosophical aspects of it, uh, and this ties in with divine transcendence. I I had written some, um, I had written down some ideas about maybe a, applying this idea to the foreknowledge and freedom problem, and somebody pushed back and said, "Hey, you know, according to Dr. Ray's, uh, you know, laying out control of you know divine transcendence and the and the humility of expectations, this only would apply to God's intrinsic." attributes, right? So divine love, obviously, in this case. Uh, foreknowledge would be an extrinsic attribute. And so I was wondering, do you think that the that this idea could be broadened to encompass something like um, divine foreknowledge and then maybe, you know, be applied to that to that problem? Yeah, I, so I think it depends. Um, it depends on exactly what you're wanting to broaden, right? So um, what's certainly true is the like the particular definition of transcendence that I give in the book as the one I sort of want to work with. Yeah. That yeah. is a claim about God's intrinsic attributes. Um, and then I, but I mean, that's not the humility about expectations principle. That's uh, basically just a thesis about God that then is supposed to apply or imply the humility about expectation right. principle. Right, yeah, sorry. Um, and so if, you're, if your question, I don't think it is, but if your question were, you know, can we make transcendence apply to extrinsic attributes, I'd say you can, but then you start getting into the kind of weirder, hardcore notions of transcendence, according mm -hmm. to which we can't really say anything about God. Oh, that makes sense. But, but if you said, no, I don't care about that. Like, I just want to know, can I broaden the humility about expectations principle? Then I'd say, sure. I mean, um, there's like, obviously in a philosophical context, you'd be under a burden to explain why you think um, we ought to have the level of humility that you think we ought to have. 
about our expectations in relation to foreknowledge. But um, I guess in like, <laughs> I guess I think as a general rule with God, humility about expectations is a good plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't, th I wouldn't just think off the top of my head that that's going to be indefensible, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I got to have these interviews before I write anything because <laughs> that was uh, really helpful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ray. That was great. Tyler, do you, I know you have another one. Yeah, so I'll, I'll ask one last question. Uh, and then after I ask the question, I'll, I'll pipe down and, and let, let you have the last word and let Mike say whatever else he wants to say as we close. Um, so uh, there's a paper written by Tyler Tabor uh, uh, and, and I, I co-author it. And uh, in it, we argue that... Um, God's existence is kind of very, very reformed in some sense. Uh, God's existence, actually, he, he, God's not hidden, right? The, his existence is obvious. It's just our cognitive faculties following a Plantingian sort of line um, aren't uh, functioning optimally, right? Or, uh, and so um, it may be because of sin, for example. And so uh, there's this kind of idea that God's not hidden. He's obvious. And you know what? If reflection on um, uh, perhaps one one objects and says, "Well, okay, fine. Um, how come God doesn't just fix everyone's cognitive faculties <laughs> uh, immediately, right? Just just make everyone operate optimally, and so then everyone could see God, at least those in the right sort of epistemic environment." Um, we we kind of say something like, uh, we, "Again, following Plantinga's uh, Plantinga's sort of thought. Uh, well, hey, at the end of the day, um, if Christianity seems true to us and you know it's the product of properly of the proper function constraints and so on um and the person it just seems to, to them obvious still that Christianity is true then they're sort of within their epistemic right to continue to believe and they can still be warranted and so on and so forth and that um it's been a while since I wrote the paper this is like five years ago um and uh you know we, we sort of just sketch why God might not want to immediately fix everyone's faculties, just kind of given at least a little something to work with. Um, so anyway, I was just curious as someone who's thought about the issue far more than I have, uh, do you have, and, and someone who comes from more of a reformed tradition than I do, <laughs> uh, uh, do, you, do you have any initial thoughts on that sort of approach? Yeah, um, so I, I can't remember if I said anything much about that approach in the book, but I've, I've talked about it in at least one other article on divine hiddenness. Um, it, I mean, there's an interpretation of Romans 1, according right. to which that's just the right response, right? I mean, it, it looks like Paul affirms something like that. Um, and so, so then the question is, well, then why don't I just lean into that, you know? Um, and I guess the answer, um, and there are a couple answers. One is, um, uh one is it's it's not pastorally helpful right like um if you're dealing with someone who's and there are lots of people like this who it seems to them that they're seeking god right um and it seems to and it seems to them that they very much uh you know, like they're longing for God and they want a relationship with God, but they just can't find any evidence. They can't make themselves believe counter to the, what their evidence seems to be. Um, it seems almost cruel to say, well, you know, the existence of God is obvious, <laughs> right? Um, and the problem is you've just like, things just aren't working in your head. Um, uh, now, I mean, of course, what seems cruel to say might nonetheless be true, right? So that's not, uh, like, that's not a reason, it's not a sort of uh, truth-oriented reason to reject that view. But it is at least reason to think, I mean, I guess I, I sort of think like this often when I'm thinking about theology. If it seems like it would be cruel to say something to somebody, I really ought to rethink whether God actually uh, is telling me that this is the truth, right? Um, that's one thought. Uh, the second thought, though, and this is this maybe more gets to the utility of the response. Um, I guess I think in the end, it just um, 
uh, it just sort of pushes the the problem to yeah, it's like a bump under a rug, right? It just pushes the bump to another location, right? Right. Um, I mean, the the yeah, the, the, the question isn't anymore why is God hidden? He's not. The question is why has God uh, not fixed? Why hasn't God fixed all our faculties and made them operate optimally? Which is the quick response that we give at the end. But yeah, I, I agree. It sort of just moves the problem from one location to another. Yeah, and then and basically then whatever whatever you're going to say in response to that question, um, it may well carry over, um, right? Uh, just to the problem of hiddenness straightforwardly, you know, not. Uh, I, I guess a third thing too, though, is um, that response does um, call into question, or it does raise the question of what concept of obviousness you're using, right? Um, uh, so, you know, um, like if, I can imagine a high level math class, right? Where, you know, the nobody in the class gets it. Um, and the math professor is struggling to explain the concept because he or she thinks like, it's just obvious that, you know, that things play out this way. Um, you know, uh, like what sense would it make for the professor to say, the answer here is obvious. You all are just broken, right? Um, I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't know what to say beyond that, except we really, I, I mean, what we what I feel like we need in that case is uh, an unpacking of what the professor means by obvious in this context, because they clearly don't mean, um, it's available to just any kind of healthy human being, right? Um, and if your thought is, well, as regards what Planetary calls the sensus divinitatis, or the, you know, the divine sense, we're not all healthy. I mean, then I guess you need um, you need more of a story about what exactly this thing is in a human organism and how it's um, unhealthiness has been diagnosed, you know, and things like that. And it's, it's just, it's not clear to me that that's all going to work out well in the end. Yeah, I've said that to myself a number of times throughout my, my very short philosophy career. Uh, this is obvious, but I'm just broken. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Ray, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. But before we let you go, uh, what's on the horizon now? What sort of new projects, things you're working on, things we can expect coming out soon or maybe in the near future? Yeah, a couple different things. Um, I've been working for a while on the metaphysics of the self um, uh, and what people call narrative conceptions of the self. Um, so you get a bunch of people in multiple disciplines talking about how um, the human, like they say things like, you know, a person just is a story. You know, the human self is narratively constituted. Human identity is narratively constituted. Um, and I've, this is an important idea, not just because a lot of people affirm it, but because it's sort of, it seems to have made its way into um, clinical settings. Um, you know, the whole notion of, you know, narrative repair is a, like, that's a, therapeutic tool um and it's also kind of interestingly at odds with um uh other i don't want to call them therapeutic methods but like um i don't know it, like in mindfulness traditions but also in the christian mystical tradition which is where i first started getting into this idea you get um you get a, an apparently contrary thought namely that the way to certain kinds of self-improvement are um, by stopping the narrating and just kind of entering a state of contemplation, of, you know, just sort of present moment awareness and listening for God, you know, and things like that. And so I just kind of got interested in all the, all of these interconnected questions about 
how narrative relates to the constitution of human persons, what sense can be made of the notion of a narrative conception of the self, what progress can be made on ideas about um, self-transformation and even the Christian doctrine of the atonement if you invoke um, narrative conceptions of identity. Uh, you know, I've been working with some biblical studies people on, on this stuff. They tell me that um, the some of the ideas about Christian identity in the, you know, first centuries after Christ were all sort of uh, heavy on narrative, right? Um, so it's sort of a cluster of questions that I'm thinking about. Um, but so that, and also, um, I've, I have kind of a project on the nature of worship and self-annihilation. Um, like this is a kind of important theme in, especially in medieval mystics. Uh, the person I've been reading quite a bit lately is Marguerite Perret, but you find it in other mystics too, that um, the person who sort of the, the highest way to be is to have your will just vanish in conformity to the divine will. And they've, Perret thinks of this explicitly as a kind of self-annihilation. And that strikes me as like, wow, really? Like, how could that be okay? <laughs> and yet there's there's a whole lot of what she says that sounds totally right. Um, so I'm just kind of interested in exploring that stuff too. Wow, really cool. That's that's awesome, Dr. Wright. Thank, thank you so much for your time, for everything. We really appreciate it. And we're really excited to look for those, look out for those new projects coming up. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, you Thanks, bet. Mike. Thanks for having me. This was fun. <laughs>